All right, now in Ezekiel chapter 28 here. Um, of course, the whole book of Ezekiel is pretty heavy. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of negative preaching. I mean, God just just you know Ezekiel's out and he's just saying you know condemning you know Tyre, Zidon. He's going through all these cities and all these places and just saying like all these bad things are going to happen. So what we see here in the beginning of the chapter is that it says the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man. Say unto the prince of Tyrus. So now he's speaking to basically the ruler of Tyre, the ruler of Tyrus, right? The prince of Tyrus. He's the, the, you know, the guy in charge there. And he has this, this um, you know, pretty, pretty harsh words for him because this guy's basically lifted up in his heart. He's really proud. And he's thinking like that basically he's a god. He's just saying he's so lifted up in himself and in his pride and his accomplishments no one can touch me. I'm like a God. And he's saying, look, you're going to be brought down really low. He says, the guy that kills you, he's not going to think you're God. You know, the guy that's going to take your life from you. And what he does here, and you have to find this, and a lot of times you see this maybe a little bit more often in the Old Testament than in the New. Um, we kind of go back and forth a little bit between things that are really projected and happening at that time and also more prophetic statements about things that are going to happen in the future. So what we see in this chapter, if you notice, he goes from describing and characterizing the king of Tyre with then go talking about Satan. Okay, and, and if you didn't catch that, you can see in verse 14, it says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. So he's not talking about the man of Tyre anymore. But he, what he's doing when he puts those two together, for one, he's, he's you know putting them close together and, and basically saying he's lifted himself up like Satan has. But we get to learn, and, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm kind of done. This is all just introduction with what we're talking about. In this chapter here in Ezekiel, we get some information about Satan is what we're doing. And we're going we're gonna to look at some attributes of the devil. And um, we're going we're gonna to springboard from here. We're going to segue from there. Look, if you would, at verse number um, 13. This is the first evidence that... He's not talking about the king of Tyre anymore, and we're talking about Satan, because he says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now, obviously, at this time, that king of Tyrus, he wasn't in Eden, right? I mean, Eden is a, a long time ago back at the creation, okay? Um, no man has been in Eden except for Adam and Eve. I mean, those were the only human beings that were in the garden of Eden. So now he's saying, Thou hast been in Eden. This is where he's talking about Satan, okay? He says, every precious stone was thy covering. We get to see a little bit how God created Satan. Now remember, Satan wasn't always evil. Satan was a created being. So when God created Satan, he made him this very beautiful creature. He was an angel. He was, he was, he was this, you know, this creature that God created. He was a cherub. Okay? And it says here, every precious stone was thy covering. And then he lists off all these stones of Sardis, a Tobaz, diamond, you know, all these beautiful stones. It says, um, the workmanship of thy tablets, right near the end of that verse 13. And of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Now, tablets and pipes, he's talking about. You know, tabrets and pipes are things that produce music, okay? And you could also think of, like, your pipes, you know, it's probably like his voice, okay? But he uses these words, tabrets and pipes. We can see here, we can deduce, Satan is a musical creature, okay? First, he's very beautiful exterior. He's got all these stones, you know, he's covered. He looks really great, and he's God has also given him this great musical talent and his great musical ability, which is not surprising because we see in many other places of the Bible, you know, God has creatures that are created in heaven that all they do is just say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which is and which was and which is to come. And just they just say it over and over again. God has beings that are serving him for various purposes and various reasons. I think God enjoys hearing music. He enjoys Hearing that, which is why he created Satan with those, you know, with those good attributes. Okay, but what, the reason why I'm going through so much detail this morning to kind of point this out is because we need to understand that Satan is a musical creature, and Satan has a lot of influence in our lives today. 
And music is an extremely powerful, um, it's just a really powerful thing. I mean, music is what it is. And, and music affects different people differently. I'm one of those people that, you know, I love music. I love music. I love the sounds. I love the, the words. You know, I, I love music. I love singing music. And hearing music has a big impact on my soul, and it really reaches down inside of me. Now, my wife isn't exactly the same way. She could go without music and just, and, and it, it's not a big deal. She hears stuff and it doesn't affect her the same way. But a lot of people, music becomes an integral, integral part of their life because they like it so much. Now, before I got right with God on, on this subject, I loved almost every single kind of music that there is out there because I could feel it. It meant something to me. I, was, I would listen to this stuff, and man, it just makes you feel good. I mean, you can hear these different songs. It can invoke emotions. I mean, some songs could, could bring you to tears. Other songs make you really happy, excited, full of energy. You know, all these different things. Music is extremely powerful. Extremely powerful. If anyone has had experience like that, you know what I'm talking about. And the thing is, we, that's why it's so important to understand that Satan was built and he is created as a musical creature. Music has so much power. If Satan wields that kind of power, we need to make sure, hey, I want to make sure I'm not listening to the devil's music. Because the devil's going to lead me astray. The devil's message, what he's trying to get across, he's trying to get everyone away from God. And what I'm going to preach about this morning is the devil's music. We need to understand that it's out there and it's rampant in the world today. And it's rampant. And if you would just be honest with yourself, and this is what I'm asking too, because a lot of times with, with sermons like this, we're talking about something that, that is really close to people. And people really, really love it. And it's going to be hard maybe to, to think about this. Maybe there's something that you're listening to that you ought not to be listening to because it's devil's music. And maybe you didn't really think about it before. Maybe you didn't realize it. But I'm going to try to expose this to you this morning so you can understand what that is. And please, I just, just, just ask, try to have the attitude that you can say where you can be open and say, is this really righteous? Is this good? Should I be listening to this or is this something that's put out by the devil? And I'm going to give you lots of evidence here to, to try to expose that to you so you can understand that. But just keep in mind, this, this is a serious issue, and, and don't just let your, your emotions or, or how connected you are with that thing, with that music, blind you from seeing the truth about this. Okay, and, and, and as with any of sermons where we preach on sin, where we preach on different issues, you know, we don't have rules in this church. Go out and do whatever you want, but I'm trying to tell you the truth this morning. Because I care about you, and I want your life to get better, and, and music can have a very powerful influence over your entire life. And I want you to, to see this this morning, and hear me out, and, and come to the conclusion at the end what you think. Because we understand, first of all, this is my first point, Satan is extremely smart. He's been around for a long time. He picks up wisdom as, as the years, as the centuries, the the you know, thousands of years go by. We only live a short time on this earth. We only gain so much wisdom. He's been around for a long time. He's very subtle, the Bible says. He's a deceiver. He's out to trick people. And I've said this before, but every time, I can't help but say it again, every time we talk about Satan, he is a con man. And the best con man that's out there is not going to come, he's not going to come to you with horns and a pitchfork, exposing to saying, I'm the devil. If he wants you to believe him, he's going to come to you like a minister of light. He's going to come to you like he's from God. He's going to come to you like, hey, you can trust me. I'm good. I mean, the best con men in this world are the ones that gain your confidence. They gain your trust. And, and, they, and they, they spend a lot of time building that trust before then they abuse you and then they expose you and then they steal from you or whatever it is that their goal is to do. And Satan is the same way. And he has a good understanding of human nature. He knows that he can't just turn the entire culture of a country around overnight. It's something that he has to attack incrementally, slowly, day by day, year after year. He has to chip away at it and chip away at it and chip away at it and attack from all these different avenues. 
when you want to change the core values and the morality of a country. And that's what's happening today. You can look back. We're going to look back just not even 60 years ago in this country to today. And if you think about it, you know, you don't see the changes in your daily life necessarily. Maybe a thing happens here, a thing happens there. You don't see the big picture until you step back and say, what were things like 20 years ago? What were things like 40 years ago? What were things like 60 years ago? And nowadays, they may be able to say that and say, oh, well, you're just super old-fashioned. You know, you're crazy if you think that way. The people who call me crazy for preaching things and saying things that everybody believed just 50 years ago. And that was just common knowledge. I mean, this stuff about the sodomites, this is brand new. The homosexuals being just completely accepted in society. They say, oh, yeah, don't worry about what they're doing. Everything's just fine. I mean, even 15 years ago, it wasn't looked upon that way. And this is the power of the media and of music, the television, the movies. They get in your head. They brainwash you. you. You let this stuff come in because it sounds good, because it feels good, because it tickles you. It tickles your soul. You say, oh, this feels good. And you're allowing that content to come into your brain, and it influences you. You might not think it does, but it will. You might think, oh, I'm, I could, uh, I'm, I'm better than that. I can understand that. I can see it for what it is. I'm just going to listen to it because I like it anyways. If you keep on getting the same message pumped into your brain, it will have an impact on you. It has. It's had, it's had an impact on the entire society. Just to give you an example, okay, not even 60 years ago, Elvis Presley was on the Ed Sullivan show for the first time. And back then, they only showed him from the waist up. And the reason why they did that is because his dancing moves, when he would, when he would move his hips back and forth, was considered indecent. It was considered something that, that by, by and large, by the general public, by the general population, he shouldn't be doing that. That's, that's lascivious. That's wickedness. He shouldn't be shaking his hips like that. So the Ed Sullivan Show, because of this, pop, you know, because of this, this thinking of the, of the culture, they only shot him from, from the waist up. If someone were to say that today, people would look at you like you have two heads. Oh, the way that, that Elvis dance, with what's going on today, I mean, literally, the rock stars, the musicians of today are practically fornicating on stage. They're almost completely naked. In many cases, they are naked. They're, I mean, they have their concerts and, they, and they're getting naked on stage. And they're openly worshiping Satan. I mean, you look at some of these people, they have... Literally, they'll, they'll have images and idols up on stage. They'll have like these gods the, 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 with the goats and the bulls. You look at all the occult symb symbology, the symbolism, and, and all these false gods and pagans. You see that these days with the current rock stars up on stage with all of this filth. I mean, you see the Madonnas, the, the Miley Cyrus. The, the cave, you know, whatever, all these different people, all these whores and whoremongers that are, that are promoting this wickedness. And we're going to get into a lot of people today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expose you because here's the thing. People hear this kind of preaching. If it doesn't get very specific, you might think, oh, well, what I'm listening to is okay. And I've got a lot of stuff to, to kind of just to point out and make you think twice about what you're listening to. See, these people today, the, the, these wicked musicians, they glory in their shame. That means that, you know, normally things that would make you ashamed, normally something that you would do, we'd be like, man, I hope nobody sees that. I hope, I hope nobody knows that I did this thing, you know, whatever it is. I mean, that's why even today, like, you don't want to just be, uh, be around people and just be completely naked. You'd be ashamed. If I, was just, if I were just to walk out and be like, oh, there's a whole bunch of people here and I'm just completely naked... I would be embarrassed. I would be ashamed, and rightfully so. We ought not to be naked in front of a bunch of people. That's just one example. But see, these people, they glory in it. They, they're proud about that. They boast about that. They'll see that and say, hey, I'm so wicked. Look what I do. And, 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 and they'll, they're glory in it. That's why they're up there, you know, women kissing each other on stage and doing all kinds of, of perverted, sick stuff. And they're saying, look at me, put the cameras on me. 
They glory in their shame. The Bible says in Philippians 3.18, you don't have to turn there, it says, For many, of, many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. There are enemies of the cross of Christ out there today, and, and the vast majority, a lot of those enemies, you'll find them in, the, in Hollywood, you'll find them in the music industry, they, don't, they, they hate Christ, they hate God, they want to have nothing to do with them, they glory in their shame, their God is their belly, all they care about is filling themselves, all their riches and all their wealth, and living this party, lavish lifestyle, that's what they care about and that's what they live for. Many of you may not know this, but there's a man, a Satanist called Aleister Crowley. And I don't want to get too much in depth on that person, but he died in like 1947 or something like that. And, and he has had, the reason why I'm bringing him up, I mean, this guy, his, he, he claims to have received a vision and, and, and this law, and he basically started his own religion. He started his, completely his own religion and his law was do what thou wilt. Whatever you want to do, just do it. Basically, if it feels good, do it. That was his... And oh, and by the way, I was a girl, he was a sodomite. He was homosexual. He hated God. He, he was brought up like Christian and completely rejected it. Went out, started his own religion. He, he was... I believe he would probably receive, you know, demonic influence. He was possessed by the devil and, and received this stuff... I don't think he was just making it up, but either way, even if he did, I mean, it's an extremely wicked philosophy that just says, hey, if it feels good, do it. This man has had influence on many, many, many rock stars, even up to this day. Even up to today. He's had influence on the Beatles, on Led Zeppelin. You know, um, um, one of the members of Led Zeppelin bought his old house in, you know, um, Somewhere in Europe, I forgot where. Um, these people, I mean, they, they, they really are heavily influenced by Satanists. And so let's get into this a little bit. So we're going to start. And, and so a lot of these bands are old, but they are still popular and they're still listened to today. They're not all. I've tried to get some newer ones in there. See, I haven't, I haven't listened. I haven't kept up with any of the current you know, music theme or you know, rock stars that are coming out these days. I stopped listening to all that about, you know, seven years ago or something like that, and I have and, and I destroyed my entire music collection. It's gone. Okay. All the wickedness, all the wicked music that I used to listen to is gone. Let's start with the Beatles. Okay, I, maybe some of you know this, but it's a little bit before before our time if you're in my generation, but I'll tell you what, the Beatles are still extremely popular. People I, I used to listen to them. I used to I mean, I knew exactly who they were. All these songs, a lot of people still know them, they're still played on the radio. John Lennon claimed that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. He compared themselves to Jesus Christ. It's blasphemy just saying, we're more popular than Jesus Christ. We have more influence on these kids than Jesus Christ. And, and the sad part is that part of that is true because they were having a huge influence on the young generation and, and, and a lot more probably than, than Jesus Christ was having in their lives. But um, he also posed nude on the cover of his album. Again, they glory in their shame. Him and his wife, he put out an album where he's just completely naked on the front cover. And um, he wrote the song, Imagine. Extremely popular song, right? And then he says, Imagine there's no heaven. Imagine there's no hell. He says, No reason to kill or die for, and no religion, too. This is his utopian society. See, his song, Imagine, it's all about, oh, how great the world would be. Hey, if there's peace, if all those other things. So he lists off a lot of things that are good, and he says, yeah, imagine there's no heaven. Hey, imagine there's no hell. Imagine there's no religion at all. This is what this guy believes. This is what he espouses. This is coming from his heart. He believes this stuff, and you're going to listen to his songs. You might say, oh, well, I want to hold your hand. Is this a, is this a simple, you know, harmless song? Who's it coming from? Where's the source? It's coming from someone that hates God. It's coming from someone that wants to imagine and just live in a make-believe land where there's no hell. And that's the way they live their lives. And I mean, you can get, I'm not going to get too in-depth on any one of these people. If you look up 
you know, start looking more about their lives and what they believe and what they think and more of their songs. I'm just touching on these so you can at least see, hey, look, this is something that they teach. And this is something that they're getting into your head. And you say, well, I just like the way the song sounds. That's how they get you. You like how it sounds. And that's most people today, and I was exactly the same way. I know this firsthand. You like music because you like the way it sounds. You like the beat. You like the rhythm. You like whatever it is. The compilation of the musical instrument sounds great. Usually you don't even think about the words. You might be able to repeat them. You could sing it. You know them, but you never really think about them. A perfect example of that there was a song, and, and um, it's again, it's an older song. It's called Lola. And this song, I mean, I knew the words of this song, and it's not like this is one of my favorite songs, but I just like music so much. I was just, I mean, I always had the radio on, always had CDs on, always had stuff playing wherever. It took me like probably 10 years of hearing that song before I realized this song's about a transvestite. <laughs> this song's about a man dressing up like a woman. And this other, you know, the guy singing is like coming on to this woman and then finds out that she's a man. And that's perverted. That's disgusting. That's not something you ought to be singing about and talking about. That, that's nasty. It's gross. Yet, this is how powerful music can be, is that you don't even think about those things. And they get into your head to where you're like, oh, I didn't know that song was about that. I had no idea. You can even be singing along with it, not thinking about it, because that music just blinds you and you, and you let it come in. The Doors. Jim Morrison. See, a lot of these people are just, I mean, it should be very obvious, but in case it's not, you know, I, I was a big Doors fan too. Jim Morrison, one of the lyrics of his song says, cancel my subscription to the resurrection. He says, send my credentials to the house of detention. That's what he's saying in his music. He's just saying, hey, my, and, and he's obviously using poetic language, you know, cancel my subscription to the resurrection, being resurrected and going to heaven. He said, cancel my subscription to the resurrection. He says, Send my credentials to the house of detention. And again, another song you have called The End is filthy and disgusting. I'm not even going to get into the details of it. It's perverted. Basically saying he wants to kill his father and then do something else with his mother. That's what he says in his song. Extremely perverted. Extremely nasty. These people are wicked. They're vile. They're, they're, they're reprobate. They're given up to these to these wicked thoughts that normal people would never even think about. Yet they put their message to music and everybody loves it. And I see, I believe that Satan is involved with this and he gives them the special musical abilities and musical talents in many cases to, to get into your head and to get into that and, and into your way of thinking. The Rolling Stones. Sympathy for the devil is what I was talking. Sympathy. Sympathy for the devil. And they get people, again, I mean, these, a lot of these, all of these people that I'm mentioning here are all groups that I used to listen to, because I'll tell you what, I'm going to get to this point a little bit later. Everything I did in this sermon is all just from memory. This is all just stuff that I know for years and years and years and years of listening to this trash without really thinking about it, without really realizing it. It's garbage. Okay? I don't want to listen to someone that has sympathy for the devil. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. The devil is out trying to get you to go to hell. He's lying and deceiving. The devil doesn't want you. He's not interested in anything good for you. He's going to lie to you. I'm not interested in someone then that's going to create a song that says, I have sympathy for the devil. And I'm going to create a song to, to, to you know, bring, lift the devil up. David Bowie, again, open sodomite. And... He's, and if you didn't know this, David Bowie is a song, and I meant to do this, I forgot to do this in preparation. He's a songwriter. You also got to watch out for that too, because see, you have these extremely wicked guys. They make a lot of songs that other bands go out then and they'll sing and they'll perform and they'll play them. And you think that they wrote it because it's, you know, this band is playing it, but they really have these other songwriters that write it for them. And that's the case, that, that's the case with Garth Brooks, that's the case with so many other people. They don't usually come up with their, a lot of them don't come up with their own original content. Someone else does it for them. And um, that's what David Bowie, David Bowie had his own content that he played, but he also um, wrote, was a songwriter, wrote for many, many popular rock bands. Bob Dylan, I saw an interview with Bob Dylan 
where he claimed to have sold his soul to the devil. He claimed that that that's that basically um, he made a deal and, and he just he he sold his soul to the devil. And there's again there's a lot more there's a lot of people. You start looking into that. People who have claimed to sold their soul to the devil and have sold out to, to gain the popularity and get the fame. There are a lot of people like that. Snoop Doggy Dog has a song called Murder Was the Case, where he's exactly describing a deal that he's making with the devil. Now, if it were just maybe one person, you could look at that and say, oh, that's, you know, whatever. They're just, they're just artists and they're just coming up with this story. But this is a common theme in the popular music, and, and, and it varies between all different kinds of groups. I think the guy's name was Jimmy Johnson. He's considered like the, um, the, the, the godfather of rock and roll, a guy who's like, who basically created my, like blues and rock and roll. He has a song about the crossroads, or he went down to the crossroads. And you might have heard this song covered by like Eric Clapton and other people say, I went down to the crossroads. Led Zeppelin sang a song about this. And again, it's referring to these crossroads where this guy went down and made a deal with the devil to get this fame and his popularity and his musical talent and ability. And there's, I mean, there's all kinds of history people talking about how this guy, you know, he didn't know how to play at all. People didn't want him playing for him. Didn't, you know, he wasn't very good. Went away for six months, came back, and could play like no other. And just had this extreme talent. Said no one saw him practice. No one said they said he didn't even have to practice. Said normally musicians have to practice and keep up and keep playing and stay good. They're saying this guy was just like he would just pick it up and and the, he just knew the song instantly. There is, I believe, with all my, I believe completely that there is a spiritual influence on many people out there, and it's not of God. And people are receiving a, a lot of extra, you know, some of these be, some of these top popular musicians. I believe literally people have sold their souls to be able to have this type of, you know, and, and why, why would it be a strange thing if you think about this? What did Satan tempt Jesus Christ with when he was on this earth? Do you remember when Jesus was tempted of the devil and when he was in the desert four days before night? How the devil brought him up? To see all the kingdoms of the earth. He said, all of this will I give you if you bow down and worship me. The devil's willing to make deals like that. He tried to do it with Jesus Christ. Now Jesus Christ said, you know, get the head, Satan. He said, get it, you know, get out of here. And um, but but many people don't don't feel the same way. They're willing to sell it, they're willing to, to, to say, you know what, I want to live for now. I want to have. The, the riches and the honor. This is going on, my friends, and this is and it, the more you, you look into this, the more you'll be able to see just the, the historical. I mean, even just people talking about it, even the, the very people themselves saying it. Elvis Presley covered a song. I don't remember who the author is, but he's, it's 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 very again a real popular song. Frank Sinatra said the same sang the same song called My Way. In that song, he says. To say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. Referring to someone who prays, someone who kneels down and pray, prays. And it's, the whole song is about, hey, I did things my way. My way. Hey, I might have done some things. I've had a few regrets. But you know what? The most important thing is I did everything my way. That's what that song's about. Hey, and, and I mean, the whole thing is called my way. I did it my way. I didn't listen to anyone else. I'm not going to listen to God. I'm not going to listen to anyone. I did it my way. Does that sound like a godly song? Does it sound like it's righteous? We're supposed to be living our lives and doing things God's way, not our way. And that goes back to, I mean, Frank Sinatra, Elvis Presley, these, these people who now are considered like, like parents would probably be happy if that's what their children were listening to as opposed to the filth that's out there today. And even back then, but see, it's incremental. So these, the, those lyrics don't sound as bad, yet the philosophy is still there. It's still been getting into people's heads. And this is how that, that the uh, morality gets eroded. Metallica, I'm not going to spend too much time on it because I think they're pretty obvious. They have songs like The God That Failed, you know, Jump in the Fire, Creeping Death. And see, Metallica was one of my absolute favorite bands of all time. I love that band. And they have so many songs that are that are... 
basically based on a lot of stories in the Bible. And see, I would trick myself and say, oh, well, see, it's okay because they're, they're just singing about these songs, about these stories from the Bible. But they do it from a different perspective. They don't do it from the way that, we're supposed, that, that you read it. I mean, their song, Creeping Death, is about, the, is about the death angel coming through and, and killing all the firstborn of Pharaohs, of, of the Egypt, Egyptian sons, back when Moses was leading the children of Israel out of, out of, um, out of Egypt. And that's literally what the song's about, but it's, it's from this, this dark side of it. It's, it's from the death side of it. It's from this, you know, and that's how all their music is. Jump in the fire. Jumping into hell. I mean, look, this is not good music, folks. It's not the type of stuff that we need to let allow into our minds. Pearl Jam, again, and think about this. The politics of all, almost every single one of these rock stars and popular musicians, they're all extremely liberal. Extremely just socialist, communist, extremely liberal. Everything goes. There's no problem with anything. You know, homosexuality is fine. Anything against God is fine. Pearl Jam was pro-abortion, and, and see, this is something that I used to listen to them too. And uh, girls, stop it right now. They're pro-abortion, and I would have to reconcile that in my head and say, you know what? When I buy their CDs, when I go to their concerts, when I do this stuff, I'm, I'm giving money to these people. They're getting my money. I'm supporting what they're doing, and they have these agendas that are completely against God. They're, they're, they're supporting and funding places that... that just make abortion easy, and just, they're, they're for killing babies. They covered a song, and this wasn't their original song, but they covered a song, it's called Last Kiss. One of the lyrics says, she's gone to heaven, so I've got to be good, so I can see my baby when I leave this world. Now, is salvation about being good? Absolutely not. That's a, that's a works-based salvation. That's a false gospel. And this is what they're singing about. But see, these things get repeated, and they get into your head, and you start getting this mindset, well, I've got to be good to go to heaven. I've got to be good to go to heaven. Now, when you hear the song, it's just this fun song, and it sounds good, and, and you feel good, and then you don't think about it later. But the thing is with music, and it's I know on the radio station, they play the same songs over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, and they get drilled into your head, and this is the message that's getting your head. I, I, I'm able to quote these lyrics today without even having listened to many of them for even a decade and they're still stuck in my head i can quote to you i can sing songs from like entire albums of music that i don't even listen to anymore just to show you the power of music and how much it sticks with you nirvana kurt cobain the guy that you know the guy that shot himself commit suicide he would perform dressed in drag, wearing women's clothing sometimes. And he wrote, I think on a, on a church wall, he wrote, God is gay. Okay, do you want to listen to someone who's saying that type of blasphemy, saying that God is gay? Think about that next time you hear a Nirvana song. Think about this pervert and what he's espousing. And you say, do I really want to listen to this guy? I don't care how it makes me feel. I don't care if it makes me feel good. I'm not going to listen to that wickedness. Jimi Hendrix said, music is my religion. That religion is voodoo. Huey Lewis in the news. Say, well, come on. Huey Lewis in the news? Huey Lewis, that guy, I mean, that's just, that's just his bubblegum pop music, right? He's got a song called Jacob's Ladder. We talk about he's running from a fat man selling salvation in his hand. He's talking about some guy witnessing about Jesus Christ. And he says, now he's trying to save me, but I'm doing all right, the best that I can. And he's talking about Jacob's ladder. He's talking about the ladder that goes up to heaven. He's talking about when, when Jacob saw the, the angels ascending and descending, and that's what he's singing about, Jacob's ladder. He's talking about working his way to heaven. The same way with, with Led Zeppelin, you know, stairway to heaven. Um, you know, he's buying or building a stairway to heaven. Right? Workspace salvation. And again, among all these different artists, among all these different groups, you're going to get the same theme pumped into your head over and over again from different angles. Slightly different angles, but it is. Workspace salvation, workspace salvation, workspace salvation. You don't even think about it until you step back and start analyzing and say, well, wait a minute, what is this really saying? Who is 
this really coming from? What is the source? The source behind this popular music is the devil. It's the devil's music. Elton John was an open sodomite. He's a homosexual. Garth Brooks, adulterer, glorifies alcohol, glorifies fornication in his songs. You know, Easy E, I don't know if you guys know, is a rap singer. Died of AIDS. I wonder how he got AIDS. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you know, the media try to tell you, oh, no, 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 you know, it's not from having homosexual sex that gets you AIDS. It's, you know, other people get it too. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Okay, maybe some drug users can get it too, but that is such a small percentage of the time. There is one, by and large, one way people get AIDS. And it's from being a sodomite. Tupac. On one of the covers of his albums shows him being crucified, as if he's Jesus Christ. Not to mention all the, the murder and the violence and everything else that goes along with that music. And, I mean, I wasn't the big Tupac fan, so I don't have this, this big memory to, to, you know, to draw from. But I'm trying to hit just about every type of music today because somebody listens to this stuff, you know, people listen to this stuff all the time, and I listen to just about everything. Nine Inch Nails. And it's been rumored, I don't know if this is true or not, that, that the, the, even the name of the band, Nine Inch Nails, are referring to the nails that, that were used for the stakes in Jesus Christ's crucifixion. Um, you know, Nine Inch Nails, these big nails, and used, used to nail them across. They have a song called Heresy. This song called Heresy says, God is dead and no one cares. If there is a hell, I'll see you there. This is the boldness that these reprobates have to just say, hey, your God is dead. If there's a hell, I'll see you there. And, and you go to these concerts, and they're like worship services. I mean, these guys are up on stage. They got the lights. They got the pyrotechnics. And you've got a mass of people with their hands all up in the air. They're all excited, and they're chanting and repeating these words and singing along with heresy. I was there. I've been to these shows. I know what goes on. It's wicked as hell. Billy Joel. Bill, oh, there's another one. Oh, Billy Joel. What's wrong with Billy Joel? He's got a song called Only the Good Die Young. He says, I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. The sinners are much more fun. Only the good die young. And he's talking about the good people die young. And what he means by good people dying young, it means, oh, you don't go out and fornicate. You don't go out and party. You don't go do all these fun things. So when you die, he considers you just to be young because you haven't experienced all the wickedness and all of the sin. That's what his music's about. That's what that song's about. Led Zeppelin completely satanic. And I'm not going to spend too much time on them. If you don't know Led Zeppelin is satanic, then you've got some issues, especially with all this other stuff that we've been talking about. Kid Rock. Kid Rock has a song, I am the bull god. He said, because I'm the bull god, you understand? The illegitimate son of man. Now, what was Jesus Christ called? He was called the son of man. He said, I'm the bull god. The bull god is Satan, okay? In case you didn't know that, the bull, the horns, that's Satan. The bull god is a false god. It's a satanic god. And he says, I'm the illegitimate son of man. The legitimate son of man is Jesus Christ. I'm the bull god, the illegitimate son of man. He says, I am free and I feed on all that is forsaken. Yeah. That's wickedness. I mean, that's satanic. It's openly satanic. Yet you listen to this garbage and you let it get into your head. Smashing Pumpkins song says, God is empty just like me. God's empty. There's this band called Fuel, and they're not quite as popular maybe as some of the other ones. They have this song called Strip. He said, I sat at Satan's table. I drank the wine and feast of revelry till my eyes were red and swollen. My soul was soiled with stains that just won't come clean. Talking about people doing so much wicked. He says, my soul is just completely soiled. These stains, they can't even come clean. I sat at Satan's table. Why is there so much reference to Satan in these, in, in these musicians' songs? Why do you think that is? It's not a coincidence. 
Black Sabbath. Okay, there's. And we're going to say that's not going to require very much exposing at all. Ozzy Osbourne, right? I mean, completely openly satanic. But they, you know, you may not know this. Black Sabbath, they claim, and, and all the members of the bands agree. This is on record. They say. They claim to have a fifth member of their band. Now, there was only four human beings that were playing instruments in their band. They claim to have a fifth member. And they said, we can't explain it. We don't really know. You know, it, it's, it's just when we all get together, when we get up on stage and play, it's as if there's a fifth person in there just orchestrating the whole thing and basically that they're just along for the ride when they're playing their instruments that someone else basically takes over. Some other force, someone else is taking over their bodies and they can feel it and they're on stage and they know it, but they're, they think it's cool. They're okay with it. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're putting out this music. And that's satanic, my friends. ACDC, again, I mean, another band, Highway to Hell, Hell's Bells, they're talking about all these songs about hell. Motley Crue is a song, Shout at the Devil, and again, Molly Crew's another band. They've got the, the, the pentagram, you know, the upside down five pointed star, all kinds of wicked symbolism, all kinds of wicked music. Van Halen, right? Van Halen has a song, excuse me, that says, You don't have to die and go to heaven or hang around to be born again. It says, Just tune in to what this place has to offer because we'll never be here again. He's saying, don't worry about heaven. Don't worry about being born again. Just, just tune in to what we got right here. The here and now. Live for today. Do what thou wilt. Do whatever you want to do. Whatever feels good, do it. Yeah. And he, that's the same song. He goes, I want the best of both worlds. A little heaven right here on earth. Is this the music you want to be listening to? You say, oh, well, this other song is okay. This is what they're putting out. This is the source. This is where it's coming from. You too. They were supposedly a Christian rock band, right? I'm not even going to get into their newer garbage. Even their old stuff back then, even when people still thought they were a Christian rock band, they have a song. Still haven't found what I'm looking for. It says, you broke the bonds. You loosened the chains. You carried the cross of my shame. He's talking about Jesus Christ, right? You know, I believed it. Again, believed, past tense, says, you know, I believed it, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I heard about Jesus Christ. He took the cross. He bare my shame. I believed it, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I'm still, still searching. But that's not good enough for me. That's one of his songs. And, of course, Bono, the lead singer, dresses up like Satan on stage. I mean, he puts on the horns and, and everything else in, in, in his performances. I don't know if he's still doing that, but he was. Katy Perry, okay, you might not have heard of Katy Perry, I don't, I don't know, I've never listened to any of her music, but she started off as a Christian artist, right? That's how she started off her career, doing Christian music. Has a popular song about kissing another girl. Obviously she switched from being a Christian artist. Promoting everything that's wicked and, and disgusting and promoting the homosexual agenda. Miley Cyrus is doing the exact same thing. I mean, these people are getting worse and worse. They're on drugs. They're in. They're you know. They're getting drunk. They're they're, they're in these alternate states of mind like all the time. They're they don't care about it. They're living this lifestyle. They don't care who sees it. They're glorying in their own shame. And the sad part is, how many children are listening to this trash, this garbage? You have these these last two like these Katy Perry's and these Miley Cyruses. People think, oh yeah, look, because they were like a Disney kid when they started off, and they're this wholesome, no they're not, they're extremely wicked, they're whores, they're, they're sluts, and, and they're, you know, promoting everything that's wrong, everything that's wicked, and, and kids these days, young kids are listening to this stuff. And I have to say, shame on you if you're a parent and you're allowing your kids to listen to this garbage and this trash. Shame on you. You're affecting the next generation of kids to come. You're responsible for, the, for you're probably responsible for the moral decay in this country. You shouldn't be listening to it yourself, let alone letting your children get exposed to the vileness, to the, to the wickedness, 
to the anti-God movement that is the popular music of today and of yesterday and of yesterday and of yesterday. And shame on you if you don't even know what your children are listening to. You better know what they're listening to. If you're a parent, I don't care if they're a teenager. If they're living in your house. You better know what they're listening to. And don't let them listen to this garbage. Kids are being brainwashed by this music and being desensitized to the wickedness of the sin to the point where it's just glorified. And kids now think it's cool. Hey, they think it's cool. You know, I'm going to sip on my gin and juice and I'm going to drink alcohol and I'm going to have all these, these whores at my disposal. And this is the life. Look at all my money. Look at all my, my fancy things. Look at all these women. Look at all this booze. Look at all these drugs. Isn't it cool? And this is what you're going to let your kids listen to? This is the upbringing you want them to have? And if you're listening to even if you don't let your kids do it, what kind of example are you setting? You need to do what I did. Take this stuff and burn it. Don't sell it. Don't let someone else get involved in this nonsense. Destroy it. Burn it. Get rid of it. It's of Satan. It's the devil's music. The Bible says in John 2, 1 John 2.15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The Bible is admonishing us, don't love the world. And the world, I mean, is personified in the, in the entertainment industry. That's the world. The world is doing this stuff. It says, don't love that stuff. Don't enjoy that stuff. Don't partake in that stuff. Have nothing to do with it. If the love of the world is in you, he said the love of the Father is not. And just, I wanted to go down this list real fast. Man, I'm, I'm running out of time. This is so much stuff. Known sodomites and all these people I listed off. Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones. David Bowie. I mean, Kurt Cobain was dressed in drag. I don't know if that's bad, if that's if, if he was an open sodomite or not. Elton John, Easy E, we know, died of AIDS. And I'm not sure on, on the rest. Katy Perry talking about kissing a girl. Huh. Open sodomites and Romans 1, flip if you would to Romans 1. You get a little bit of an idea of what, of what the homos really are like in Romans 1. Look at verse 26 of Romans 1. I'm not going to read the whole thing. When you get time, if you haven't read Romans 1, read, read the whole chapter because it really goes in depth. It says in verse 26, For this cause God gave them up, unto vile affections. This is all people that God gave up. Okay? People who didn't, they, they, heard the, they heard about Jesus Christ, they heard about salvation, but they rejected Him. They completely rejected Him. They worship and serve the creature is more than the Creator, is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And verse 29 says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So you're saying that's a big list of attributes of these reprobates, of these sodomites. A huge list of really negative qualities. And he says, not only do they know that they're worthy of death, he says they have pleasure in them that do them. 
let me ask you this. Do you think that you ought to be having pleasure in the things that the music that these people are putting out or the movies that these people are putting out? Should you just have pleasure in those things that they're doing when they're this wicked and when God has rejected them and when God has given them up to a reprobate mind? And you're, you're receiving the thoughts of their heart and of their minds and you're getting that plugged into your brain to the point where today, years and years and years later, I could just repeat all of this stuff from the top of my head? Is that something good that you want to have just, just plugged into your body and into your brain? The Bible says in James 4, 4, it says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. I don't want to be considered an enemy of God this morning. I don't. So you know how I'm going to make sure I'm not an enemy of God? I'm not going to be friends with the world. I'm not going to listen and... and, and partake in the things that the world has to offer. And again, like I mentioned already, almost every single quote is by memory. Almost every single one. There's a couple I looked up just to make sure I was saying the right thing, but there's almost the vast majority of them, I know I wasn't saying the right thing because I have it memorized, because I know it. Just from, from years and years of listening to this trash. Music is used for teaching. And you see that from the Bible. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The Bible says that we use the hymns that we sing, the hymns that we sing in church, the psalms, the spiritual songs, songs that we sing, are actually teaching and admonishing. That's part of the purpose of singing the songs. They teach us. They admonish us. It's no different with the world's music. Hey, it's teaching you something. What is it teaching? Where is the source coming from? Is it of God or is it of the world? Remember that. And don't think that these, these songs that the musicians are putting out are just, just harmless. Oh, they're just meaningless. They have an agenda too, okay? You talk to these guys, and because they, they call themselves artists, right? They, they treat what they're doing seriously. They're not just, just, well, I just need some words to go with this tune. No, they have a message. They have a story they're trying to tell. They have some kind of message that they're getting across to you, and they're using their music to do it. That's what they're doing. I mean, that's, talk to any musician. Talk to any of them. That's what they're doing. And they're going to use their liberal perspective to infect your mind. They're going to use their God-hating perspective to get into your brain. I have to skip over some of this stuff. I'm totally running out of time. Turn, if you would, please, to 1 Samuel chapter number 16. See, there's nothing wrong with music in and of itself. The Bible we already said says, um, you know, talks about speaking um, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and that's you know we use that to teach and admonish one another. The Bible says in First Chronicles twenty five verse one, it says um, it's talking about these the leaders of the music, Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun. He said who should prophesy with harps, with psalteries, and with cymbals. So he's saying they're preaching, they're prophesying using musical instruments. That's something that, that was ordained here in 1 Chronicles 25. It says, They prophesied with a harp to give thanks and to praise the Lord. Psalm 40, verse 3 says, And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. We ought to have, a, if you're a Christian, if you're saved, you ought to get a new song in your mouth. Not the songs of the world. Get a new song, um, even praise unto our God. Those are the types of songs we have. Hey, God loves music. He created Satan to be a musical creature, not so we can go out and deceive the world, because God likes music. The biggest book of the Bible is the book of Psalms. And if you didn't know this, the book of Psalms is a songbook. That's what it is. This, these, these psalms were put to music. This is a songbook. There's also a book called Song of Solomon. Two books of the Bible, songbooks. They're songs. And we see other places where... Um, and I didn't turn there, but, you know, Moses, God had Moses teach the children of Israel a song. And the reason why he did it is because 
they're going to remember this. He had a song put the music about them coming out of the, the land of Egypt and all this other stuff and how great God is and all the great things that God did so that later on, you know, when they start to turn away from God, they'll still know this song and that'll still be with them and it'll witness against them. But um, if you're in uh, 1 Samuel 16, look at verse 14. This, we're going to see a story here about King Saul and David. Okay, remember King David was after King Saul, David and Goliath, David slid, um, killed the, the giant. King Saul started off a righteous man. He started off right with God. You know, God chose him. He was little in his own eyes. You know, God just said, okay, the children of Israel wanted a king. He said, okay, well, we're going to, you know, use Saul. Saul could be the king. And um, Saul started off good, right with God. But then he started veering off and, and not obeying and not listening to what God had for him to do. And he started getting a little bit proud. So what happened is that God sent an evil spirit to Paul to vex him, to, to trouble him. Because God wasn't happy with what he was doing. He was chastening Saul as any father does with, their, with a child that's starting to go astray. God was chastening Paul or Saul. He was rebuking Saul. And... Here we're going to see what Saul's solution was to his problem of being vexed by God. Look at verse 14 of 1 Samuel 16. It says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants, and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is, a cunning, that is cunning in playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse, and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass, laden with bread, and a bottle of wine, and a kid, and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed. And was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. So here we see Saul's got a problem because he's got this evil spirit from God that's troubling him. And like I said, up to this point, see, Saul started to turn away from God. He started not obeying him, not doing the things that God had for him. God's troubling him. Now, what should have solution should have been? The solution should have been, I need to get right with God. Right? I'm I'm just gonna I'm gonna humble myself and I'm gonna get right with God. Then maybe he won't trouble me, right? Then maybe I won't, I won't have this, you know, this evil spirit coming and troubling me. But instead of him getting right with God, what does he do? He hires David to play music for him. And just to show you kind of this power of the music, the music worked. The music worked. The, the, you know what? That, that evil spirit that was troubling Saul went away. Saul felt good. His spirit felt good when he heard this music. Now, think about this. You think, Dave, David said the Spirit of the Lord was with him. You know, he's a righteous guy. Do you think David was just playing the world's music and the wrong kind of music? I don't think so. I think David was playing the right kind of music. The, the you know, godly music. Christian music. Right? But Saul was using this, this, this Christian music instead of getting right with God. He was using it for the wrong purpose. So the reason why I'm pointing this out is because First of all, a lot of people will say, and I'm going to talk a little about Christian music, I'm going to close with this point because we're out of time. But a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, I don't listen to the world's music, I listen to Christian music. First of all, when people usually say they're talking, they listen to Christian music, it's just the world's music with Jesus Christ added in. And when you're patterned after the world, you know, you, you shouldn't be listening to the same kind of music, it's the same exact thing that the world's putting out, but you just add Jesus Christ to it. That's not Christian music. I mean, that's, you might call it that, but that's not really what it is. Um, you know, God's music is different than the world's music, than Satan's music. 
But I talk to people and they'll say, oh, well, but I feel so close to God when I listen to this music. I would say, how do you know that that's God that you feel close to? How do you know that that feeling has anything to do from being from God? Because it might not. And I was out sewing and I talked to a man and this is a similar story. And I was trying to show him the truth of God. I showed him all these scriptures about how you can't lose your salvation. It's a free gift. It's eternal life. He didn't believe that. He believes you can lose your salvation if you, if you don't do good works. And if you, and if you, you know, get out of church or turn your back or whatever it is. He's not saved. He doesn't believe in Christ alone. But what he was, what he's telling me, he said the reason why, one of the reasons why he believes what he believes, he says, I pray to God, I ask him to tell me the truth, and he says, I get a feeling. He says, I get a warm feeling. And he says, how can you explain that? I said, okay, well listen, I don't trust just feelings. We need to trust God's word. Okay, because anyone can have feelings. I said, let me ask you this. What if a Muslim were to say the exact same things that you said? And said, well, I asked God to show me the truth, and I got a nice warm feeling, and the Quran is the truth, and Muhammad is the truth. And I'm sure there probably are Muslims out there that, that, that get feelings. Because, you know what? I also got feelings when I would listen to rock and roll music. It made me feel good. Okay, you get feelings for all different kinds of reasons. It doesn't mean it's from God. Just because you're listening to what, you know, so-called Christian music and you get a feeling, hey, I could get probably the same exact feeling listening to rock and roll. You don't know that that feeling is from God necessarily. Now, and again, that doesn't mean that, that God can't give us feelings. You know, that you can't get a feeling from God. I'm not saying that that can't happen. What I'm saying, though, is you don't just trust in a feeling. You have to trust in what we know is fact, what we know is God's word. Use that to analyze the feeling. Is that feeling righteous or not? See, Saul, Paul, Saul, Saul shouldn't have been using that music. He should have just gotten right with God. That music provided a feeling for him to feel better. It was a band-aid over his real problem. And you'll see later in other chapters that that solution fails him later anyways. David keeps playing for him later when the evil spirit comes up and then it doesn't work anymore. And then he picks up a javelin and he tries to kill David. <laughs> the guy that's playing the music for me, he picks up a javelin and tries to kill him. So, um, it's, it, you know, don't band-aid the situation. So anyways, all that's kind of a long sermon. Um, it really hits home to me. Okay, this is something that was a huge, a huge part of my life. Huge. I mean, I, I still love music. I love it. But... You have to make sure that you're getting the right music. Don't be listening to the devil's music. It's extremely powerful. I mean, I could give you example after example of my own life where I try to get right with God. And I, looking back, it's a lot clearer now than it was back then. When I was trying to get rid of different sins, get rid of drinking, get rid of other things. As long as I kept listening to that music, I kept failing. And it took me a while to realize that. I didn't know. I was ignorant of it. Did, I didn't quite get, I didn't see the connection between the two. Because I didn't really think that the music was all that bad. I knew, I was able to say, well, I know this is wrong, but I still like the music anyways. You know, whatever. I'm, I'm okay with that. It's extremely powerful to have an impact on your life. And that's, that's the whole purpose. You know, I hope you just take this, this sermon to heart. And, and my motivation for preaching it is to help you and... You know, if you can walk out of this and say all those people you mentioned, you know, like they're just fine, there's nothing wrong with them, then you got other issues. But think about the source of the music that you listen to. Think about where it's coming from and their agenda and what's getting pumped into your brain. And I guarantee you, take a look at it. Look at the lyrics. Look at and think about what they're saying. Analyze your own music collection and look at this and be like, is this good? Is this coming from God? If it's not coming from God, it's coming from the world. And like, as I mentioned earlier, I don't want to be a friend of the world because that's going to make me an enemy of God. But let's uh, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Your Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. I thank you for, for other men that have preached sermons and have helped me in this in this area of my life, dear God, to where I was able to, to, to get rid of and just destroy the devil's music that I had, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please just help us all to, to grow. 
Help us to, to just receive your word, dear God, and, and to just continue to do what's right. Help us all to just make the changes, whatever they are, as necessary in our own personal lives, dear God, that we could become closer to you. Lord, I know that nobody here this morning wants to be called your enemy. I know that. I, I believe that. I believe that everyone here wants to be close to you. They want to know you more, and myself included, dear God. And I know I'm not perfect, and you know what? That temptation's always there to go back and to listen to this stuff that tickles my soul, dear Lord. But I pray that you would please just help me to be strong. And, and help me just to, to find all the things I love about music and you're in the right kind of music, dear Lord. And um, that you would just bless every single person that's here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.